Hello and welcome to my channel, Fortune Forecast. I am your hostess, Daisy Raisler. And today I'd like to bring to you a book that I seem to be very interested in, have actually read it already three times, and I want to share it with you. The author is Thomas Troward, and the book is based on the Edinburgh Lectures on Mental Science. And just a little bit of background about Thomas Troward, also known as Judge Troward. He worked in India in the 1800s, and his codification or world teachings influenced many of the great thinkers of the 20th century, especially in the movement of American self-help. One of the things that drew me to his material was that he believed that the world was universal mind and the seed of all things is thought in conjunction with the universal source. And he believed that to materialize anything, one must think it and develop a sufficient desire for the goal coupled with a clear mental image of the outcome. And he also emphasized developing oneness with the source of all or with the universal mind. So having said that, I will be getting ready to jump into chapter one of the Edinburgh Lectures on Mental Science by Thomas, Thomas Troward. And his book is in the public domain of the United States. He does have a foreword. And he says, this book contains the substance of a course of lectures recently given by the writer in the Queen Street Hall, Edinburgh. Its purpose is to indicate the natural principles governing the relation between mental action and material conditions, and thus to afford the student an intelligible starting point for the practical study of the subject. March 1904, TT. I imagine those course are his initials. Chapter 1. Spirit and Matter In commencing a course of lectures on mental science, it is somewhat difficult for the lecturer to fix upon the best of method of opening the subject. It can be approached from many sides, each with some peculiar advantage of its own, but after careful deliberation, it appears to me that, for the purpose of the present course, no matter starting point could be selected than the relation between spirit and matter. I select this starting point because the distinction, or what we believe to be such, between them is one with which we are so familiar that I can safely assume its recognition by everybody. And I may, therefore, at once state this distinction by using the adjectives which we habitually apply as expressing the natural opposition between the two, living spirit and dead matter. These terms express our current impression of the opposition between spirit and matter with sufficient accuracy and considered only from the point of view of outward appearances this impression is no doubt correct. The general consensus of mankind is right in trusting the ev evidence of our senses and any system which tells us what we are not to do so will never obtain a permanent footing in a sane and healthy community. There is nothing wrong in the evidence conveyed to a healthy mind by the senses of a healthy body. But the point where error creeps in is when we come to judge of the meaning of this testimony. 
we are accustomed to judge only by external appearances and by certain limited significances which we attach to words. But when we begin to inquire into the real meaning of our words and to analyze the causes which give rise to the appearances, we find our old notions gradually falling off from us until at last we wake up to the fact that we are living in an entirely different world to that we formerly recognized. The old limited mode of thought has imperceptibly slipped away and we discover that we have stepped out into a new order of things where all is liberty and life. This is the work of an enlightened intelligence resulting from persistent determination to discover what truth really is irrespective of any preconceived notions from whatever source derived. The determination to think honestly for ourselves instead of endeavoring to get our thinking done for us. Let us commence by inquiring what we really mean by the livingness which we attribute to spirit and the deadness which we attribute to matter. At first, we may be disposed to say that livingness consists in the power of motion and deadness in its absence. But a little enquiry into the most recent researches of science will soon show us that this distinction does not go deep enough. It is now one of the fully established facts of physical science that no atom of what we call dead matter is without motion. On the table before me lies a solid lump of steel, but in the light of up-to-date science, I know that the atoms of that seemingly inert mass are vibrating with the most intense energy, continually dashing hither and thither, impinging upon and rebounding from one another, or circling around like miniature solar systems with a ceaseless rapidity whose complex activity is enough to bewilder the imagination. The mass, as a mass, may lie inert upon the table, but so far from being destitute of the element of motion, it is the abode of the never-tiring energy moving the particles with a swiftness to which the speed of an express train is as nothing. It is therefore not the mere fact of motion that is at the root of the distinction which we draw instinctively between spirit and matter. We must go deeper than that. The solution of the problem will never be found by comparing life with what we call deadness, and the reason for this will become apparent later on. But the true key is to be found by comparing one degree of livingness with another. There is, of course, one sense in which the quality of livingness does not admit of degrees, but there is another sense in which it is entirely a question of degree. We have no doubt as to the livingness of a plant, but we realize that it is something very different from the livingness of an animal. Again, what average boy would not prefer a fox terrier to a goldfish for a pet? Or, again, why is it that the boy himself is an advance upon the dog? The plant, the fish, the dog, and the boy are all equally alive. But there is a difference in the quality of their livingness about which no one can have any doubt, and no one could would hesitate to say that this difference is in the degree of intelligence. In whatever way we turn the subject, we shall always find that what we call the livingness of an individual life is ultimately measured by its intelligence. It is the possession of greater intelligence that places the animal higher in the scale of being than the plant, the man higher than the animal, the intelligent man higher than the savage. The increased intelligence calls into activity modes of motion of a higher order corresponding to itself. The higher the intelligence, 
the more completely the mode of motion it's under its control. And as we descend in the scale of intelligence, the descent is marked by a corresponding increase in automatic motion, not subject to the control of a self-conscious intelligence. This descent is gradual from the expanded self-recognition of the highest human personality to the lowest order of visible forms, which we speak of as things, and from which self-recognition is entirely absent. We see then that the livingness of life consists of intelligence, in other words, in the power of thought. And we may therefore say that the distinctive quality of spirit is thought. And as the opposite to this, we may say that the distinctive quality of matter is form. We cannot conceive of matter without form. Some form there must be, even though invisible to the physical eye, for matter to be matter at all must occupy space, and to occupy any particular space necessarily implies a corresponding form. For these reasons we may lay it down as a fundamental proposition that the distinctive quality of spirit is thought, and the distinctive quality of matter is form. This is a radical distinction from which important consequences follow and should, therefore, be carefully noted by the student. Form implies extension in space and also limitation within certain boundaries. Thought implies neither. We therefore, we think of life as existing in any particular form. We associate it with the idea of extension in space so that an elephant may be said to consist of a vastly larger amount of living substance than a mouse. But if we think of life as the fact of livingness, we do not associate it with any idea of extension, and we at once realize that the mouse is quite as much alive as the elephant, notwithstanding the difference in size. The important point of this distinction is that if we can conceive of anything as entirely devoid of the element of extension in space, it must be present in its entire totality, anywhere and everywhere. That is to say, at every point of space simultaneously. The scientific definition of time is that it is the period occupied by a body in passing from one given point in space to another, and therefore, according to this definition, when there is no space, there can be no time. And hence, the concept, conception of spirit which realizes it is as devoid of the element of space must realize it as being devoid of the element of time also. And we therefore find that the conception of spirit is pure thought. And not as concrete form is the conception of it as subsisting perfectly independently of the elements of time and space. From this it follows that if the idea of anything is conceived as existing on this level, it can only represent that the th thing is being actually present here and now. In this view of things, nothing can be remote from us either in time or space. Either the idea is entirely dissipated or it exists as an actual present entity and not as something that shall be in the future. For where there is no sequence in time, there can be no future. Similarly, where there is no space, there can be no conception of anything as being at a distance from us. When the elements of time and space are eliminated, all our ideas of things must necessarily be as subsisting in a universal here and an everlasting now. This is no doubt 
a highly abstract conception, but I would ask the student to endeavor to grasp it thoroughly, since it is of vital importance in the practical application of mental science, as will appear further on. The opposite conception is that of things expressing themselves through conditions of time and space and thus establishing a variety of relations to other things as of bulk, distance and direction, or of sequence and time. These two conceptions are respectively the conception of the abstract and the concrete of the unconditioned and the conditioned or of the absolute and the relative. They are not opposed to each other in the sense of incompatibility, but are each the complement of the other, and the only reality is in the combination of the two. The error of the extreme idealist is in endeavoring to realize the absolute without the relative, and the error of the extreme materialist is in endeavoring to realize the relative without the absolute. On the one side, the mistake is in trying to realize an inside without an outside, and in, on the other, in trying to realize an outside without an inside. Both are necessary to the formation of a substantial entity. And that concludes chapter one. I hope that you tune in for chapter two, but I will have a short dialogue. One of the things that I took from this chapter one is just that concept that, wow, what a novelty to even say that we are here to really think honestly for ourselves instead of having others think for us. So that really allowed me to dive into and chew on some of these words, especially in this first chapter, hitting it off right to the start, embracing the idea that a thought is spirit. And to kind of show us that law of opposite, it's not that they're opposite, they actually embody one thing. So the way that I understood it is, so when you have an idea, it already, that idea is already packaged with everything that can come to bring it into form, into manifestation. So just because you can't see it, you can't see the form of your idea, doesn't mean that it's not whole. So I, I'm excited to jump into the next chapters as I believe, and I already know, he's going to guide us in through how to manifest these beautiful thoughts and bring the whole thing into manifestation. So it's interesting that when we have a table that's in front of us, that is the thought manifest. Where's the thought? It's at the other side of the spectrum. But before the thought is a table, where is the table? It's all embodied in the thought. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, thank you again for joining me here on Fortune Forecast. Come back to um, catch up with Chapter 2. And as I put these videos out, I will be putting the links to the chapters.